lab guy here. Good morning. Yesterday's, yesterday's video was received very well and uh, got a lot of views and I thank everyone who took the time to watch the video. I hope you all got something out of it. There were some lively uh, comments and I always appreciate those. And uh, thanks to the fellow who pointed out that the 1K pull-up resistor was really torching base current through transistor 14. We'll look into that. I'm not sure if it's a problem or not, but it, it certainly is an issue. So on to today's subject. Yesterday I alluded to the concept of schematic comprehension, let's call it. When a person looks at a schematic, what do they see on the schematic? And Today I'm going to dive into that and we're going to look at uh, a bad schematic and a good schematic and examine how that could potentially affect different individuals' ability to comprehend what is going on. Just like bad handwriting, schematics can be drawn that are electrically accurate and just complete spaghetti, where you, you can't figure out what's hooked to what or what anything is. Uh, for instance, and we'll see this, where instead of drawing out the components by their component symbols, the uh, author will use rectangles representing the physical chips and then uh, run wires or lines in all directions coming out of them every which way, helter-skelter. And like I said, electrically, it's okay. I mean, if you wire your board based on that diagram, it will be connected correctly, but you won't have any idea what's functioning in that, in that diagram. We'll also look at a uh, section of Troy's schematic, which I have redrawn to uh, demonstrate this principle. Now, for a lot of people, I don't think you'll perceive any difference between the spaghetti schematic and my redrawn schematic because it also has a certain amount of spaghetti just by its nature. However, you'll, you'll see the difference. It, it will be significant and um, at the very least it will demonstrate what I'm speaking of. Having introduced the subject, let's move on and look at some diagrams. Looking at the schematic that Troy used to build his camera. This is the camera time base circuits page. Another page contains the video amplifiers and a previous page contains the power supplies. We will not be looking at those today. So if we look at this schematic in its entirety, there is certainly a lot going on. An experienced engineer or technician will look at this and will be able to model through most of it. They will recognize um, the three logic parts which are the issue on this diagram as the MC14528 IC2, IC3, and also the 4011 IC4. Now if you know what those parts are uh, off the top of your head, you have a step up. If you recognize them by the way they're configured with the two resistors and two capacitors and uh, two additional resistors, you may recognize that they are dual monostable mono multivibrators or one-shots and uh, my preferred term for these components are timers. I call them dual timers. A one-shot is a timer. Alright, we will get to that in a bit. So, looking at this schematic, let's start by breaking it down into blocks. The first block, which I've highlighted here, is the uh, clock oscillator that drives the horizontal scan. That's an NE555 configured as a, uh, what do they call it officially, a stable multivibrator or in other words, in simple terms, an oscillator. It does nothing more than output a pulse on pin 3 
the duty cycle of the pulse is controlled by the resistors to the left side of it, the 5.6K, and I, it looks like a 1.8K, and the 0.01 cap. They've added the 1K potentiometer up at the top, which allows adjusting the frequency, uh, but doesn't all and and it does alter the duty cycle just a bit and there is a duty cycle issue in this design which we are not addressing today but I wanted to say it out loud for the benefit of those who would be interested in that now to the left of it is our classic two transistor friends from yesterday so this is the master clock oscillator system with its ability to switch to external synchronizing. All right, let's move on. Here we are looking at the uh, input pulse processing for the reference for the vertical oscillator. There is no vertical oscillator as the timing is continuous from the two external references. Technically, the horizontal could have been the same way and it didn't need the 555 if the camera was driven with external horizontal drive. However, back to vertical. You'll note that when the switch is in the internal position, the voltage for the tube heaters, which is 6.3 volts at the power line frequency, in Troy's case 50 cycles per second, is coupled to the base of the transistor TR18. You'll note that there's a series limiting resistor to limit base current coming in. Know that this is a 6.3 volt uh, RMS sine wave. So it comes in and when it's in the positive cycle, it will go in the base of the transistor and out the emitter. And when it's in its negative cycle, it will flow through the 1N4001 diode, which forms a uh, positive and negative clipping circuit. If you put the scope on the base you'll see the sine wave there will have its uh, top and bottom chopped off at 0.65 volts approximately. Now in doing in driving the transistor this way the collector is is pulsing up and down and producing an inverted version in a square wave of the sine wave that's on its base. That would be at the input side of the 220 picofarad capacitor. Crossing that capacitor it goes into the MC14528 dual timer. Well we sure can't tell much about what's going on there can we? And if you look at the upper part of the highlight you'll see that IC2 is doing the same thing with pin 3 output of the 555 timer also goes into the block which is not very comprehensible the way it's drawn and some lines from both IC2 and IC3 all go to the 4011 which is four NAND gates there are four two input NAND gates inside that part but if you don't know your parts you have no idea what could possibly be in there. It's just a block. All right, we'll come back to this, this, this section later. I call this the pulse processor. It takes the horizontal pulse and the vertical pulse, and through the use of black magic, it creates all of the other pulses needed throughout the camera. For instance, driving the horizontal deflection circuit, which we see here. This circuit is a much more complicated, though very simple still, uh, form similar to my project, the Chief, and similar to my project, uh, the Philocam. Both use circuits similar to this. The idea is that a pulse comes in through that 270 ohm resistor on the left side and takes TR15 and switches it off and on and pumps current through some capacitors and inductors to produce a sawtooth current into the deflection yoke. That's all we'll say about that here. 
The next circuit, which isn't used in, cur in the current configuration of Troy's camera, is a constant current regulator. And if you look at the upper right, it says focus coil. This is the coil used in a Viticon tube. The iconoscope does not use a focus coil, so in Troy's camera, this circuit is probably present because it was originally a Viticon camera, but is disabled. It, sh it is not doing anything. The next circuit is vertical scan. The, um, the drive comes from IC3 pin 6 through a 1K resistor into transistor 19. Transistor 19 is acting once again as an off-on switch to short out the 4.7 microfarad capacitor which charges up through a constant current source formed by the circuit of TR20, the BC212. You see the height control adjusts that current to adjust the size of the ramp and then following that the TR21 is a 2N3819 and it acts as a preamp, a high impedance input so that it doesn't load the capacitor and distort that sawtooth. The sawtooth is a reasonably straight line sawtooth here and it couples over to the power transistor that drives the vertical coil as you can see in the circuit. That is a high power amplifier BD131 TR22 with an AC coupled output to the vertical coil. The last thing on the page is the 7815 IC5 which is the 15 volt regulator that provides 15 volts to everything on this page more or less and uh, in its classic way making this a bad schematic it is drawn flowing right to left. Uh, that's okay-ish in, in a way. Um, it's not inaccurate. It's, it's an accurate electrical representation. The circuit can certainly be constructed. But for formal schematic drafting, that component one would have been located on the power supply page since it's part of the power supply and uh, would have been drawn flowing left to right. But I nitpick at this point. So that basically covers all of the sections on this page. So going back to the full schematic we're looking at, you can see that this schematic has several sections which the untrained eye may not pick out immediately as separate sections and it's drawn okay except for the pulse processor which is drawn in the classic style of the 1970s and I want to defend the author in one more respect this was published in a magazine and magazine publishers don't have the space for 27 really nice schematics and so they usually make you put the entire schematic on one page or at the very least as few pieces as possible. So that is the bad version. And now looking again at the pulse processor section here, let's look at my redrawn version of that processor. This is me, my redrawn version of the pulse processor. It certainly looks a lot different. The first thing I'll point out, just gen general structure, it flows left to right. In the upper left we have the line drive or horizontal sink as we've been calling it generically coming in from IC1 pin 3 this, the term IC1.3 means pin 3 the NE555 and it proceeds to go into a dual timer, which I've drawn as two recognizable timers. They're wired up in a fairly busy arrangement, um, and they are apparently the first one is generating a shorter pulse than the second one. 
I'm not even going to get into pulse timing. Just let it be said that the, the capacitor on the top and its mating resistor set the time period. The nomogram on the data sheet was incomprehensible. It turns out that these CMOS parts have a timing thing that when you run them on different voltages on the power supply, in this case 15 volts, the coefficient used to work the, the formula for the timing parts is different depending on the power voltage. And the nomogram had everything in one basket. It was completely incomprehensible. So I didn't even try to guess what the timing is. We're going to ask Troy to measure some pulses and I will make a follow-up video on how to do that. So, so far I've been talking about IC2. It processes the incoming line drive on the left, upper left and sends it to the four NAND gates on the far right. That was the 4011 on the other schematic. Now, if you'll note on the far right, on the upper far right, we have three output signals that go to the video amplifier. Now, for whatever reason, the author of that schematic called the clamp pulse horizontal deflection. I have no idea why other than maybe he was just saying this pulse comes from horizontal deflection. So, it drives a transistor circuit that clamps the black level of the video to a known voltage. I won't go into what that's about, but if you AC couple a signal over a capacitor and it changes its RMS value, it floats up and down DC-wise. This pulse is used to clamp the video so that black remains black. And that's all I will say. Then the uh, three gates that are configured together take horizontal pulses and vertical pulses and combine them together to make what he calls mixed sync or in the vernacular composite sync. Now we'll have Troy look at that with the oscilloscope too. And then the final gate, the, the fourth one down, takes a, a component of horizontal and a component of the vertical and produces a composite blanking signal used to blank the video stream during the sync periods so that noise generated in the camera tube doesn't come out the output during the sync times. And from what I could see in Troy's video, that's working. Now on the bottom left, we have our, our field drive, which was that 60 cycle sine wave from the power transformer or external sync coming in to drive IC3, which is our vertical timing. Now IC3 is set up in parallel. The two, if you'll note, the two input pins number 5 and pin 11 on the second timer are tied in parallel. Looking back up at the horizontal timer IC2 you'll see that the sync pulse comes into pin 5 goes through the timer and comes out of pin 6 and is coupled over to pin 11 of the second timer. So they are in series with each other. I won't go into what that's doing um, other than to say it produces a delayed pulse of some width and polarity. In fact, if you look at the two outputs, these chips produce the pulse. One pin will go positive, the other pin will go negative, or I should say high and low. So you have both flavors available for your logic chips, as you can see. He's used that to his advantage. On the lower one, on the lower IC3, pins 6 and 7 come out and go to um, the, let's call them gates 1 and 2 up on the upper right and pin 9 output, the Q0 output of the second timer is going to the fourth NAND gate 
to produce, it, it, where it's combined with horizontal pulse to produce the blanking. You'll note in the lower right corner are two resistors. These are the two signals that went to the scanning circuits that I pointed out earlier into the base of the two transistors. Transistor 15's base in the horizontal drive and TR19's base for the vertical drive. And that pretty much covers the circuit. Now, this is an example. I, I don't want to call it a good schematic. Let's call it a call the first one a bad schematic and this one a better schematic. And that pretty much concludes my uh, description of bad and better schematics and a description generally of the pulse processor in Troy's iconoscope camera. So I hope you uh, all got something from it and I thank you for watching my videos and hopefully we'll publish another video soon and until then I'll say lab guy out